Good afternoon. I've been watching the participant numbers going up and I think we're about ready to start. Um, good morning uh, to those of you on Central Time. Good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast. My name is Paul Weinberger. I'm the University of Illinois Systems Director of Federal Relations. I want to thank you all for joining today's conversation with the president of the U of I system, Dr. Timothy L. Killeen. We're going to begin today with a presentation by Dr. Killeen with an update on the U of I and an overview of our federal agenda for the new Congress and the new administration. We'll then turn to Q&A. We've received a number of questions already. Thank you for those. And you're welcome to submit more questions through the Q&A function, which we will be monitoring during the session today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Colleen, who in 2015 became the U of I system's 20th president after more than three decades of experience as a teacher, researcher, and leader in public higher education and government, including serving as head of geosciences at the National Science Foundation, which provides more than a quarter of federal research funding for US universities. Dr. Colleen, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, Paul, and uh, hello, everybody. Thank you, I'm so grateful for uh, all of you joining us today. It's always a pleasure to reconnect with alumni advocates and friends, particularly in the DC area and around the country. And I hope that you personally and your families are safe and well amid the historic challenges that we're all facing together. This, this meeting is the first of a kind for us and the first time we've called a group like this together to lay out our federal legislative agenda at this time. It's a chance to share our priorities with you, get, get your comments and suggestions as our most loyal and dedicated supporters in hopes that you will join us in advocating for our students, our universities and our future together. But first, before I get to the priorities, I'd like to run through some achievements of which we're very proud across the U of I system and successes that we will continue to build on with the help of the legislative agenda we've developed for the 117th Congress. Our successes have been literally life-changing and the impact on the public good has never been more evident perhaps than during this pandemic. We've displayed our land grant power in real time, marshalling our world-class resources to overcome the historic challenges COVID has handed us. And that includes successful leading edge clinical trials at UIC for the vaccines that you're all reading about that are now rolling out to protect our citizens against the virus, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. And these are the vaccines that will help us restore the way of life. Uh, that we all cherish. Then, of course, there's the breakthrough testing and surveillance ecosystem. The next slide, Paul, please, that we created to safeguard our campuses against COVID. There's a very good chance you've heard of it. It's being featured on national media outlets from CBS and CNN, the Washington Post, and the New York Times, hailed as a national model uh, by Fortune magazine and our success is being leveraged by the prestigious National Institutes of Health in its efforts to improve testing nationwide. As the virus has surged in Illinois and across the nation, at times pushing positivity rates into double digits, ours has been a fraction of the world around us, thanks to what we call the SHIELDS program, pioneered by our brilliant researchers in Urbana-Champaign. SHIELD's easy and cost-effective saliva-based testing has allowed us to cast a wide net, more than 1.2 million tests to date system-wide. Rapid results allow for quick quarantine and isolation, and coupled, coupled with the surveillance technology, digital technology, and of course the cooperation and support and pride of our students, faculty, and staff, our rates have held in the low single digits and often under 1% on our largest campus in Urbana, which is home to the most aggressive testing. The number of tests here is greater than 10 states in the United States. So we are testing massively. Everybody gets tested regularly. And when we find an infected individual, we put them quickly into, into comfortable isolation to reduce the transmission of the virus. The success of this effort has attracted in interest from literally around the world. And, and our team is working as hard and as fast as we can to obtain federal approval uh, authorization, emergency authorization for this testing, which carries benefits such as liability protection and will allow us to share it more broadly across Illinois and the nation. But several clients are already using SHIELD by establishing their own clear certified labs 
including such universities as Notre Dame, Loyola, Indiana University, University of Wyoming, Idaho State, and others. And Bloom Energy, a green energy company in Silicon Valley, is using these technologies. Work is already underway to roll it out for national use in New Zealand and the Philippines. And in addition, the state, with, the, with uh, wonderful leadership from our governor and his team, is providing $20 million in federal CARES Act funding to provide for a million tests across the state's 12 public universities, including, of course, our three campuses. Um, and we're looking forward to that. This success for COVID has been guided by a strategic framework approved by our Board of Trustees in 2015. And I wanna go back over it a little bit because it's our guiding, our guiding star. It was developed through a thorough inclusive process that capitalized on the insights and expertise of our many stakeholders, internal and external. And so it's our common vision of what we seek to be in an aspirational sense. This framework is a call to excellence and scale based on four pillars that reflect everything that we are determined to be. So let me go quickly through our pillars of the strategic framework. Pillar one is an institution of and for our students. Most fundamental mission of all, to be a, an institution that supports our students to open our doors wider and wider to ensure opportunity and student success. Since we launched this framework, our system-wide enrollment has surged more than 12% from 80,000 in the fall of 2015 to more than 90,000 students last fall, which is a record, world record enrollment for the eighth straight year, even amid the historic challenges we faced this year due to COVID. And that's a lot of human beings. Uh, um, uh, and it includes, the framework includes an emphasis and a commitment to increases in areas that promote equity across our society including, and we never stop working to, to support the students of Illinois, opening doors of opportunity for underrepresented students and to change the trajectory of entire families by welcoming more first generation students. 28% of our undergraduates are first in their family. In the five years since our strategic framework was adopted, I'm very proud to say that underrepresented students across the system have increased to a record 32% of all undergraduates up from 25% in 2015. So we're making significant progress there. Our ongoing enrollment gains are rooted in extraordinary faculty and academic programs that attract the best and brightest students from around the world. Uh, we are in the top 25 for uh, uh, Reuters innovative uh, universities in the world. And in the latest US and News World Report ranking, Urbana-Champaign is ranked as the 15th best public university and UIC jumped eight spots to 52nd, putting two of the nation's very best publics under the, our umbrella. UIS again, once again, ranked as the best regional public university in Illinois and among the best in all of the Midwest. Our enrollment growth is also supported by an historic commitment to affordability. Last month, the Board of Trustees approved a tuition freeze for all incoming undergraduates next fall. This is uh, fall of 2021, adding to cost containment efforts that included a five-year freeze for Illinois students that stretched from 2015 through 2019, our longest freeze in half a century. This means that in-state residents, undergraduates, will see a freeze in six of the last seven years. Our only increase for in-state students over that period was a sub-inflationary 1.8% increase last fall an increase that we covered for every Illinois freshman through Federal's CARES Act funding uh, to help them through the economic hardships that many faced due to the COVID pandemic. So holding down costs, no matter what's happening, will be just as important next fall. And it's incumbent upon us to support our students, to open our doors wide, to make sure that every uh, deserving student is not turned away at the door because of financial circumstances. And that allows us to maintain the pipeline of next generation talent that the state needs to move past the economic circumstances that we're now in. So that's pillar one, all about our students, access, uh, affordability, success, graduation. Pillar two, is, uh, is research and scholarship with global impact. And the second of our framework's four pillars calls on us to think big 
and use our power as a research giant to solve the world's biggest challenges. You've seen it with our COVID work, but this legacy has made us a place where the world turns to solve its greatest challenges and has attracted more than $1 billion in funding this year for sponsored projects. And that ranks among 15th among universities nationwide. Our faculty received over $590 million annually in federal research from the NIH, the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Defense, the National Endowment for the Humanities and other federal agencies. So we're competitive in all of these settings. And Urbana Champaign routinely leads the nation in NSF uh, grant awards. And UIC is a top recipient of NIH funding uh, with its most recent year of funding topping $410 million. So this kind of um, uh, endowments and, and support is funding breakthroughs for tomorrow, such as pioneering work by researchers in Urbana that has engineered a shortcut around a glitch in photosynthesis that could make crops 40% more productive and provide food that is critical to sustain our growing world. And last fall, something I'm very proud of and excited by, we partnered with the prestigious University of Toronto to lead a binational consortium created by the Council of the Great Lakes region. This consortium will capitalize on a network of world-class teaching and research universities that are a strength of this region. And they'll facilitate cross-border collaborations, working with companies and government to promote sustainability and create a pipeline of talent and innovation and ensure the region's long-term competitive at significant large scale. So we're leading the charge, not just for our state, for, but for our entire region and the nation. And these discoveries don't gather dust on the shelf. We put it to work for the public good. More than 300 startups have grown from our research and our research accomplishments have landed the U of I system in the top 25 of the latest rankings of the world's most innovative universities around the world. The third pillar of the framework calls on us to ensure a healthy future for our state and for all of the Midwest. And we do this in countless ways, including the $17.5 billion economic impact that our operations and our alumni have on the Illinois economy every year. That's $17.5 billion that's brought in by our university system through jobs and economic uh, impact on the Illinois economy. That ranks as a Fortune 50 company, and most of those Fortune 50 companies spend their resources in many places other than their home state. We have nearly 800,000 alumni uh, where the impact of our research is, is sensed and there's great pride. And, uh, and, and those graduates go into the global workforce with more than 23,000 students being, um, being uh, uh, given annually. Uh, and that's a large number and thousands, thousands more every year. Uh, this is a number that would create a new city the size of Charleston, East Moline or Park Forest every single year. So not only are we excellent, we care about our students, but we operate at large scale with many, many people and families benefiting from this. Across all areas of study, we're making sure that our students learn from the very, very best faculty. Um, and a, a $60 million presidential initiative uh, has added 24 new star faculty in the last three years. So we're recruiting, we're going after talent. And these are globally regarded scholars in a host of crucial fields from engineering and medicine to public finance and history. They're voting with their feet to join us at the University of Illinois system. And the new cohort of 10 that we announced last year, and here's a, an ad that we put into the Chronicle of Higher Education to brag a little bit about this. That cohort of 10 bring with them more than $21 million in current research support and activities on day one. So this is a, a recruitment po program that's got a significant return on investment. Pillar four of our framework is entitled Tomorrow's University Today. And, and this is how we seek to make our universities the model for higher education in the 21st century, not waiting for other models to emerge, but being the best of the best in everything that we do. And in particular, it's challenged us to rethink the land grant mission in the 21st century, to take on this generation's unique problems 
and foster the solutions that create jobs and prosperity today and to do it at pace and with a commitment to both excellence and integrity. We've already met this challenge in part through our uh, very exciting Discovery Partners Institute and Illinois Innovation Network that are brainchilds of the University of Illinois system that have now many, many partners and uh, is uh, supplying the next generation workforce and innovation that will do, do so by bringing everybody to the table in an open innovation ecosystem. The best researchers, the in best industrialists, the real world needs, investors, entrepreneurs, leaders of government and non-for-profits, and of course, all leveled by flows of students every, uh, renewing every year. And as you can already see, we've been draw, joined by extraordinary partners from around the world uh, in the Discovery Partners Institute and every public university in the state of Illinois in the Illinois Innovation Network. A Boston Consulting Group analysis says that this innovation initiative is the formula for sex, success in the 21st century. And they project that over the next decade, this enterprise will pump another $19 billion into the uh, Illinois economy and create 48,000 new economy jobs, not just for high tech, but for, for um, uh, uh, individuals who may have been displaced by automation or, or changes in transportation. And so we seek to lift all of society and not just, not just the top echelons. In December, Governor Pritzker released more than $142 million in capital funding approved by the General Assembly to support this enterprise, to support construction of DPI's permanent headquarters in downtown Chicago, in the South Loop, uh, just very near to some very needy communities, as well as the downtown area, as well as multiple uh, IIN facilities and other projects on five public university campuses, including UIUC and UIC. The state funding will support construction of an iconic world-class DPI headquarters pictured in the architectural concept here. This state-of-the-art facility will be a centerpiece of new innovative capacity uh, of, in the 78, a new South Loop development along the Chicago River. Our universities have also received funding in this round to, to help with the development of the Altgeld Hall, Illini Hall project at UIUC, the new computer design research and learning center at UIC, and the expansion of UIC's Innovation Center. The Innovation Center and Illini Hall are part of the IIN network, and the state funding released last month will also support IIN hubs at Eastern Illinois University, Chicago State University, and Governor's State University. So with the leadership from the University of Illinois system, we have now a program to raise our game across Illinois, lift all of those institutions upstate and downstate. Altogether, six of the 15 IIN hubs received funding in this first round, and there'll be more to come. State capital funding is just part of recent big news for DPI. The Pritzker Foundation, in the next slide, uh, announced last month that it is donating $10 million. Paul, could you give us the next slide, please? Um, over, over five years to launch what is being called the Pritzker Tech Talent Labs. So this is philanthropic support um, to provide for a new research and training center that will be home to multiple inclusive training programs for high school students and current workers with a special focus on helping more women and people of color land, prepare for and then land tech jobs. By 2019, the Talent Lab hopes to help 7,000 people secure tech jobs, including 3,000 women and people of color. So all of these achievements we have reached by stretching for the high goals of our aspirational strategic framework. And they show us that yet again, the U of I system is a place where anything is possible, where we turn uncertainty into extraordinary. So how does all this map into our federal priorities? Our legislative priorities for the 117th Congress seek to, seek to gain the financial resources, the policies and the support to help us keep expanding our extraordinary power as an engine of progress, supporting these many students, the faculty, the research endeavor, and all of the issues that we're called on to do from our strategic framework. And it seeks to build a long productive partnership with the federal government that dates back literally to the founding 
to the land grant universities that were launched by a stroke of President Lincoln's pen and that have been lifting our nation's fortune ever since then. Our 11 priorities are outlined in the booklet you have all received ahead of today's meeting. I hope you take a look. But they target the same bedrock missions as our strategic framework. So they're natural priorities for us to express to the nation, to serve the ever-changing needs of our students, our state, and the nation. Number one is obviously providing pandemic relief. As it has been in all of our lives, the pandemic is our most urgent concern. While our universities and the system have done a remarkable job of safely navigating through the virus, perhaps among the most safe places to be anywhere, COVID has taken a tremendous financial toll. Through last November, the total impact stands at $500 million, and that excludes our hospital in Chicago. New COVID-related costs include our breakthrough testing system, ramping up cleaning regimens, and extra support for students such as hardware and software for online classes. We are also experiencing significant revenue losses, including housing refunds after students went home and nearly a year's worth of canceled events. But we're very grateful for the relief Cong Congress has already provided through the CARES Act, but more is urgently needed. So we seek your help in this advocacy. We're calling on legislators to approve an additional $120 billion in aid for students and universities nationwide including uh, pub all public and private non-for-profit universities nationwide. We also support $26 billion for federal research agencies, along with regulatory relief to address the disruptions that the pandemic has caused for research grants. And I can tell you that this call and this priority has been, been very well received by our, our wonderful Illinois federal delegation. Number two is enhancing higher education affordability access and student success. You've already seen our own commitment to that, but the pandemic has further heightened the need to ensure that higher education is affordable and within the reach of every deserving student, no matter their socioeconomic background. It's a core commitment across the U of I system, evidenced by the tuition freezes that I've described. But on top of the tuition freezes, we've also more than doubled our own institutional financial aid over the last decade to now more than 20, $258 million annually. That is making a real difference in the life of our students, including the 22% of current undergraduates who are uh, first in their family. But the impact runs much deeper. Through institutional, federal, state, and institutional aid, most in-state undergraduates pay less than full tuition and fees at every one of our three universities. 62% in Urbana-Champaign receive aid, 71% in Chicago and 81% at Springfield. So it's the minority of our students that um, pay the full tuition and fees. So we're urging Congress to continue an investment in students by reauthorizing the Higher Education Act for the first time since 2008. Our priorities for the reauthorization include increased Pell Grant awards, expanding support for campus-based financial aid, and affordable loan options for undergraduate, graduate, and professional students. We also support funding for programs that target student success and not just getting them in the door. And that's a top priority for us at the University of Illinois system, another of our many, ones, many successes. Our first year retention rate is 88% compared with the national average of 81% for four-year publics. So we retain our students at much higher rates. When they get in our doors, we do everything we can to ensure their success. Our six-year graduation rate is 76%, well ahead of the 61% average nationally for publics. And student debt averages more than $4,000 below the national average. Number three, we also urge Congress to increase funding for research, to ramp up investments in the groundbreaking innovation that creates new products, new services, new businesses, new jobs, and new waves of economic growth. This is how you create a prosperous society. Unfortunately, funding for many key, key agencies has remained flat in recent years, slowing the discovery that is crucial to move America forward and for us to be outcompete all of our competitors internationally. Federally funded R&D supports the economy today, surely, but as tomorrow as well. And it helps make the U of I system a key economic engine for our state, pumping $17.5 billion into the Illinois economy annually. 
in the next slide and supporting 171,000 jobs, one of every 46 jobs statewide. The promise that research holds to lift society is behind our partnership with the state of Illinois to launch DPI and IIN transformative activities, the education and research enterprise I mentioned earlier. We hope that Congress too will fund innovation that will fuel next generation growth in Illinois, in the Midwest, and in our country. As I mentioned, the U of I system is committed to access for every deserving student. So a strong priority for us is restoration, which we now see for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA programs. We have hundreds of such students and we wanna take care of them optimally so that they can embrace the opportunities that, that our educational system provides. It's past time to end the fears and uncertainty that our undocumented students have faced and we're delighted to see that uh, motion now. We also urge, however, Congress to approve comprehensive immigration reform to ensure that US remains a welcoming go-to destination for international students, scholars, and workers with all of the appropriate uh, compliance issues with regard to foreign interference. The presence of these workers and scholars is a tide that lifts all boats in the United States. And it creates a diverse culture that prepares every student for the global workplace that awaits them after graduation. They also support pioneering research in today's economy. Uh, international students enrolled at Illinois universities contributed $1.7 billion to the Illinois economy in the last year and supported over 21,000 jobs. Next, in the months ahead, Congress will also be weighing investments um, in the nation's infrastructure. And we hope that any legislation will reflect the critical role that universities can play. Specifically, we are urging Congress to fund education and research that provides both a next generation workforce and a resilient 21st century uh, construction for our national infrastructure. The U of I system is already helping lead the way, partnering with Northwestern University and the Missouri University system to launch the Infrastructure Technology Research Consortium and this group focuses on research initiatives that will create smart infrastructure, smart concrete, embedded sensors that can beam home to, to uh, make longer the durability of our, uh, of our infrastructure, reducing construction time and increasing lifespan efforts. We also encourage tax code reforms. This is a little bit more technical perhaps, but in the next slide, this, this will help us protect our students, our employees, and our nonprofit mission. So we urge you to help us with that. To that end, we urge Congress to address several of, of detrimental provisions of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act of 2017. Among others, we ask that legislators repeal the excess executive compensation excise tax, which will cost our system $1.2 million in fiscal year 2020. We also urge Congress to repeal rules that increased our taxable unrelated business income to more than uh, $685,000, uh, about 15 times more than the roughly $45,000 that would have been taxable before this change. There are several others in your booklet, including a request to reinstate the so-called 80-20 rule, which allowed taxpayers to deduct 80% of a contribution made for the right to purchase tickets for college and university athletic events. So I hope you will all join us in pride and advocacy for these proposals and the other initiatives outlined in, in your booklet. If you aren't already a member, Illinois Connection makes it easy to call, email, or tweet your support to your elected officials on behalf of our system. And it's easy for you to become an advocate right now. We're posting a link in the chat that you can click on to register and become an advocate for the U of I system. And we'll make it easy for you to, to know uh, what we're looking to, to advocate for and how to go about doing it and who to do it with. Thank you all for taking the time to join, to join us today and for your loyalty and commitment to our world-class university system. I've tried to touch on the things that make us special, that make us altogether extraordinary and that we're proud about, but the new century beckons and we need to do yet more at excellence and at scale to provide our students with the kinds of opportunities to, to create lifelong uh, opportunities to raise families, to have jobs and to create uh, equity and prosperity in our society. Thanks so much for your time today. 
I'll go back to Paul. President Colleen, thank you so much. Uh, we have about half an hour for questions uh, and we've received a number. As I said, you, you can continue to submit questions through the Q&A function. Uh, the first question, it's a, a two-part question. Um, what kind of longer term impacts do you think the pandemic will have on higher education? And what is your vision for higher education in the next five to 10 years? Well, that's a great question. Um, and of course that, that challenges us to, to think about the future, the post-pandemic nature of the university. I don't think we're gonna move away from uh, moorings, which are all in the land grant mission, but one of the silver linings of the pandemic is actually that it's forced us to be more nimble and innovative. We've had to go to hybrid learning. We've had to use technology. We've had to make a lot of changes and adaptations, some of which we found work well and will be likely to remain even after we detreat, um, defeat the virus. So the whole approach to learning optimally, to safe socialization for students, to, um, to timing uh, events and procedures and, uh, and, the, and the role of uh, collaboration across regions, across institutions, uh, using digital means, are all there for us to really co-design the future. Our strategic pillar that talks about inventing tomorrow's university today is really now got to take it into account all of the learnings we've had um, with, the, uh, with the pandemic. So the next five to 10 years, um, I'm excited about because I think we're leading the way on many fronts already and we're helping to chart the course of public higher education in the United States. Uh, and, and I don't think we should shy away from that leadership mantle uh, role. It'll take all of us coming together. It'll take creativity, it'll take hard work, um, but we're not going anywhere. We're, we're here and we're rooted in a, in a mission that's all about uh, impact for the public good. And I think we're gonna take advantage of all the learnings we've had and all of the issues we've come through. All of that said, there's no question, it's been grueling on all of us and all of you, of course. Thank you for that. Next question, what are some priorities of the Biden-Harris administration that align strategically with the U of I system's priorities? Well, we see, we're, we're learning about the Biden administration's priorities right now. And of course, we're not a partisan, we're not even a bipartisan, we're a partisan organization. So we don't think in terms of uh, partisan po politics, but we're, we're paying close attention to the administration's priorities. And as you've seen, we're trying to advocate for uh, what we think are appropriate priorities. Um, and there are many areas that I see of, of a clear overlap. Um, COVID relief, which was our number one priority, um, is clearly on the radar screen um, nationally. And we'll see how all that unfolds in the, in the, in the near um, term frame, reference frame. The Biden plan includes $35 billion for higher education in the American Rescue Plan, along with $50 billion to expand testing. Both of those would be really beneficial to the University of Illinois system. And I think given our ability to test at scale and the demonstrated success of that, uh, we're very supportive of, that, uh, of, of those uh, efforts. In science and technology, um, uh, reconstituting the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, elevating the Office of Science and Technology Policy to a cabinet level. Um, I like the look of that. It implies that science and technology, which is of course my own background, um, uh, having been at NSF, will, will have a, um, a larger visibility in, in the new administration. I've already talked about DACA because we, we, we care, we love every student, no matter what they come from, no matter what trials and tribulations they've had to go through uh, to reach our, our doors. So uh, we're happy to see that. And uh, on health equity and disparities, I think there's important uh, priorities too that sit well with our healthcare mission. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna optimize best we can the strategic alignment of the new administration. And as you know, Paul, we're working directly and um, intensively with every one of the bipartisan Illinois delegation to make sure that they fully appreciate and have a chance to uh, advocate on our behalf as well in DC. So those, those priorities seem to sit naturally with many of the things we care deeply about. Great. Next question, and I promise I didn't write this myself. How can the federal government better support land-grant colleges? 
Well, we, we love the land grant mission. I use the term a lot. Uh, you know, when we were developing the, the framework, we thought for a little while, should we move away from the land grant as a term of art? Because not everybody naturally understands what, what it means. Um, of course, if, you, if you're an alum, you, you know exactly what it means. It means public, affordable, accessible, uh, prestigious, uh, excellent public education that, that is inclusive in outlook. And uh, so the land grant is part of our mission, part of where we came from and what we look like. We ultimately decided to keep the phrase because it's so meaningful um, his historically and, and, and sort of recast it in land grant for the 21st century. So um, we do think these institutions are of enormous importance to the country. Um, if, if you look at the, just the just the the, uh, the discoveries and the inventiveness and the new new whole industries that have flowed out of the land grant systems writ large, every state has a land grant university. It's been incredibly important to um, to America's prosperity and and competitiveness. And of course, we're very proud to have been in the first group of land grant universities. And we think of ourselves as a land grant system, although of course, Urbana Champaign was the original, original one. The federal government plays a cr critical role in supporting these institutions. And it should be a broad partnership with state, federal government, um, and other stakeholder communities. Um, and, and as you've seen, we're advocating for federal student aid, such as Pell Grants, which are extremely important to make sure that um, financial impediments don't get in the way. And the investment in research by the federal government is incredibly important as well for land grant universities. The thing about universities like ours is we have experts in all fields and there's a natural willingness to work across intellectual boundaries and disciplinary lines to create the kinds of families of solutions, knowledge and competencies that will be very important for, for the future. And of course, I voted with my feet to be at a land grant institution, but I think they're uniquely positioned to provide the solution sets that are not just biotechnical or biophysical, but they also include human decision making with risk and uncertainty and all of the issues of how people inter and society interacts. Um, we are a petri dish for that kind of new knowledge to come forward in product ever more productive ways because of our scale and our coverage. So the uniqueness of these kinds of institutions, very different from smaller private in institutions, which can be excellent as well. So it's a combination of the scale, the integrity, the excellence, and the commitment to the public good, I think make land grant systems like ours really important for the future. And we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna make that case and we're gonna stick with it. We've gotten a few questions about vaccines, so I'm going to just combine them. Um, how are COVID-19 vaccines being rolled out on campus uh, this spring and in the summer? Well, as I pointed out, we're, we've been heavily involved in the vaccination clinical trials. So we've got expertise um, for, for the, cl um, the clinical trials on, on vaccines and been doing that for months. In fact, the success of those clinical trials have led to the authorization now to deploy these uh, vaccines, Pfizer, um, Moderna and, and soon to be the Johnson and & Johnson. And in our clinical trials, we focused actually on how underrepresented minorities respond to vaccination. Um, and, and that was an important uh, insight, which has led to where we are now. We are, of course, offering vaccinations as fast and pervasively as we can. UI Health in Chicago has offered vaccinations already to all the healthcare workers and those who support the healthcare system. Uh, including staff, uh, custodians, students, trainees, faculty in the health science colleges. In, in addition to the UI health vaccine team, we're immensely grateful for the students, staff and faculty volunteers from the colleges of nursing, pharmacy, dentistry and medicine for more than 4,000 volunteer hours that they have logged to give over 14,000 vaccinations since late December. Uh, just yesterday, we opened a new large-scale vaccination site in Chicago on the west side at the Credit Union One Arena, formerly called the Pavilion. Um, and this location is offering vaccines to those in phase 1B. We're following all of the CDC and public health authority guideline, guidelines in terms of the tiers and so forth. 
Um, and phase 1B in Chicago is now aged 65 and over, over and other essential frontline workers. And in that site, we, we, uh, we are planning to have as many as 40 vaccine stations that will be running up and running. So we're, we're very anxious to get that going um, rapidly. But we've already done, last time I looked, more than 14,000 vaccinations in, uh, by UI Health. So we're experts in it and we're, um, we're working through all of the guidance that comes down from the public health authorities. At UIUC, there's a strong partnership with um, our university there and the Illinois Department of Public Health and coordinating with the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District to distribute the vaccines um, uh, and we're collectively leading vaccination distribution for all employees in the county. Um, but we, we see this rollout as being, you know, slower than we would all like to see, but it'll go um, charge through the, through the spring, of course. Uh, vaccine appointments now in Urbana-Champaign are, are available for higher education employees in select categories. UIS has been designated as an approved site to deliver COVID-19 vaccination. And, uh, and while we're still uh, trying to figure out what exactly that means, we're, we're ready to go uh, at UIS as well. So our whole posture is to, um, is to be ready and um, able to vaccinate at large scale using all of our expertise and our knowledge of how these vaccines work. We're a little bit limited by the supply and by the, the tiering and the phasing structures of the, of the public health uh, districts and, and, their, and their rules, but it's up and running and I'm, I'm happy to see it uh, accelerating as well. Here's another question. How well is hybrid education working at your universities? Well, that's another great question. Um, we were forced into hybrid education like in a matter of a week to 10 days, as you all remember in, in March. Um, UI had the advantage of many things because we were the, we were the uh, institution that created the web, first web browser. We were the institution that actually created the first ever educational software back with Plato. We're out no, now all dependent on educational software, right? Piped into homes. Um, and, uh, and so we, we've done a lot of innovative thinking. We were also the first institution to create the concept and deploy it of a chat room that we're now using literally as I speak, right? That's how we're all working together. So UVI was as well positioned as any university to move quickly into this hybrid um, formulation of limited but substantial face-to-face -face coupled with online education. And, and we've done it as well as any university. I'm very proud of the excellent quality of the uh, online components and the face-to-face -face components. And incidentally, UIC just, was, just got ranked as number two in the country for its online undergraduate education. So we're good at this. We have 150 programs already and online, but we've been buffing them up and improving them over the summer months. Um, so it's been going well. I would say the hybrid model has been going well, thanks to the strengths, legacy, capabilities in online teaching and education. UIS has been advising the whole state on how to do online education in K through 12, for example. And we've taught everything from chemistry to dance to history with online as well as uh, in face. We've provided training for our faculty and instructors. And um, so we've, we've jumped into it as we always do with, with two feet. And now that with a testing regimen, has been as successful as it was in the fall. And we're already seeing for this new semester, very encouraging signs of very low positivity, safe environments, good compliance with the protocols, et cetera. We're gonna be able to ramp up our face-to-face -face components in this hybrid uh, system because students clearly benefit from and want to get more face-to-face -face exposure to um, but we're not gonna have the jammed in like sardines, um, big classes, of course, and mask wearing and protocols will be all, all in place. So I'm proud of how well the hybrid, hybrid education system has worked. And as I said earlier, lessons learned from this experience, I think will be, will, will, will provide, will enrich our thinking about what comes next as we, as we look at the next phase of the land grant mission and including th such things as lifelong learning opportunities for upskilling and reskilling and uh, credentialing and so forth as, uh, 
as we try to kind of expand our offerings? These are all good questions, Paul. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Colleen, for laying out your federal agenda. What can we alumni do to help you with that agenda? Help us directly by joining Illinois Connection, um, by clicking on the, the, the buttons that you, uh, you look at and you think are appropriate for what you want to do, um, making the representations, uh, supporting um, to the extent that you think it's appropriate, um, our agenda um, in, in advocacy, uh, showing up um, events like this is incredibly important and, and not just demonstrating your commitment, but it's important for all of our staff to see that we have a community that is engaged in this mission with us. So it's not, you know, um, so uh, I think there's one area where I think you can all help and that is to help us with the narrative that I've tried to distill in this 40 minute discussion and I've talked too long probably, but um, it's a great narrative. And, you know, I'm just one voice uh, I hope you recognize I'm a strong believer in the upward arc of this narrative and its genuine importance for the future. Um, help us with that narrative, because lamentably, um, I think public trust in higher education and in other institutions has eroded a bit over the last decades. Um, it's eroded because of cost concerns, because of concerns about, you know, you know, problem sets and, and maybe um, accessibility concerns. And, uh, and, and we want to sort of reset the narrative. So to rebuild that public trust and confidence in these institutions as being in direct support for them. That's why, so help us with the narrative, telling the stories. You know, our best narrators actually are our students not our presidents, frankly, um, there are students, um, but, but many of you have been students and you know intrinsically the value proposition and how it had meaning to you and your life and your families, expressing that broadly. Um, I often joke that, you know, you can turn to the person in the supermarket queue when we can do that again, or maybe in the spatially distant supermarket queue, and you may have to shout a little bit through your mask and say, did you know that the University of Illinois system is responsible for one in every 46 jobs in the state of Illinois? And those, those, those talking points do resonate. I, I, I know that firsthand, they do resonate with decision makers, but they have to be reiterated and reiterated and reiterated because there's, a, there's not a natural sense of trust and confidence in um, institutions like ours. And we need to take it upon ourselves to rebuild that. So please help us with the narrative, couch it in your terms, join Illinois Connection. Um, and, and if there's a button there to you know, um, message to your uh, congressperson, then I'd encourage you to do that. These decision makers do have a, an amazing voice. And this is a very, interesting time in history. Obviously a new administration coming in, there's some rethinking going on. Um, uh, we've coming out of a pandemic. How do we get out of a pandemic? I think we can make the case that the U of I system has done better, uh, is the model for how to deal with, um, with uh, this transmissible disease on a campus that's got 50,000 students on without a single hospitalization or a single death or any evidence that the community in which we're embedded got infected from students. Unlike other you know, college towns can't say that. So spread the word is basically what I would say that this sort of simple response to the question, but thank you for asking. Next question in the chat. Uh, what are some steps that the university system can take to expand mental health services and programming across the U of I? Um, do you believe the state of Illinois and or federal government should uh, allocate funding for public universities to hire more clinicians and provide infrastructure for counseling services? Yeah, thank you for that question too. Uh, I'm very worried about the mental health implications of this pandemic for our young people. Um, the, you know, the combination of isolation, less ability to socialize, um, uh, to make new friends, which young people are, you know, wired to do. Um, uh, and all of the stresses involved in, in, uh, in the public health crisis that we've all been living through have taken their toll on, on people. Um, 
So we need to worry about mental health issues. And in fact, we've held a, a system-wide symposium on this very topic just a month or two ago. Uh, we, we brought in ex, an expert who we've now taken on a consultant. Um, each of our three universities is working hard on this. Um, it is surely um, appropriate to increase mental health counseling on, um, on, our, on each one of our universities and we're moving in that direction. Um, however, there are more things uh, to, to work on as well. So, things such as safe socialization, check-ins, making sure that we're a, a, a caring, mutually caring community that groups and individuals don't feel uh, left behind or left out. But wh while we have a strong commitment to First Amendment and rigorous debate, we, we don't demean one another and we have a culture of respect that, that uh, pervades our, our, our system. But you're right to be worried, it's right to be asking that kind of question. I would put it in right up top almost of the concerns that we have now of the impact on this pandemic. And then if you think of the K through 12 communities too, the, the, um, the parents who are trying to juggle jobs and teaching and um, young people um, and uh, all of the multi-generational families that are not, no, no longer able to do what they once felt was so natural uh, as easily. I think there's stress in the whole so of society and we need to be working with our, um, our experts. We have experts on, on, all of these, on all of these functions. We have policy experts that are writing reports on family resiliency, uh, for example, and many other factors that go into creating a durable, resilient community in times of stress. But we need to walk the walk too on our campuses. And, and we've engaged our students in, in this thinking as well. So that we, um, there, are, there are many things that we're working on. We're adding social workers to um, our police um, uh, uh, so, that, so that we can address mental health issues when, uh, when things blow up, blow up a little bit so that the first instance is not, uh, is not draconian in any sense. So I think there are many things that we're working on here. Each university has its own set of priorities. They're slightly different in Chicago than Urbana-Champaign. But mental health of our students is a great concern for us, and uh, we're working on it. But I would also say the mental health of our faculty and staff is also a significant concern. And our healthcare professionals, the nurses and the, the janitors who clean up rooms in the COVID wards and so forth. So um, we have to take care of a lot of people, and it's a um, it's connected tissue that, that as a community we need to sort of manifest um, uh, and be a little bit more fault tolerant, I think, uh, these days than uh, than perhaps before. So that we recognize, you know, our consultant came in, and one of the things he said, yes, refer uh, when you have an issue that you need to refer to a professional, but also try to relate to the individual who may be, you know, who may be anxious, may be alone, may be fearful, um, that just relating as human beings to others is an important part of how you build a culture of care in a community like ours. Long rambling answer, incredibly important question. Um, we're close to the hour, but I think we have time for, for one more question. Um, I'm looking at a question about our, our uh, Defense Department uh, funding. Can you discuss uh, the Applied Research Institutes um, and how it fits in with the overall research strategy of Illinois? And in particular, how can the university leverage ARI, DPI, and other units on campus to transition 6-1 and 6-2, which is the, as, as you know, Dr. Colleen, the, the basic DOD research into yeah. efforts that use 6-3, 6-4, and 6-5, which is the more applied R&D research funding. Yeah, yeah. So that, that question is in the context of ARI, which is a fantastic institution that we're very proud of and is very energized and uh, excellent and successful in, in gaining DOD research. I'd like to put it in the overall context of translational work and not only answer with regard to the DOD agencies, but we do support work, uh, research for the DOD, uh, the DOE, uh, and, and in fact, we're doing seminal work in, in, in hardening infrastructure security, cyber security as it relates to the grid, uh, for example, is something that we're really working on 
um, very successfully with uh, DOD agencies as well as DOE and other agencies. But I think this whole thing about how do you take what you called 6.1 to 6.3, it's really taking basic research elements of new knowledge and applying it broadly through applications that serve uh, society in broad ways. That's what DPI is all about. Um, and in so doing, you create jobs and companies and small, medium, large businesses. You create collaborative pathways. You basically build society up. And you solve problems as well along the way that are meaningful problems. So because of our emphasis on the public good, we want to do good things that serve society, whether it's in national defense or in um, grid security or in um, bio biomedicine or vaccine development, therapeutic development, uh, uh, in, in agricultural uh, aspects, transportation, you name it. We want to serve society by not just creating the new knowledge and disseminating it to our students, but deploying it and translating it into, into service to society. So that is all in, in my mind, part of what we call the land grant mission. Land grant is such a great term. It encompasses everything I just said. It goes all the way from taking care of, of people who need an education to supporting society through providing the good services, ideas, companies, jobs to support society in all of these different domains. ARI is, 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 an, is an amazingly important piece of that. We're very proud of the, of the connections we have with the, uh, with the DOD as one of our uh, you know, very significant funding agencies. We'll continue supporting that um, as we move forward. But I think this is a time in the next 10 years where this focus, there's been a bit of a false dichotomy between pure versus applied science or this is for us, but not that piece of it for us. The whole thing is a continuum. And I, in my simple mind, I think you can do excellent work in, in research that enables practical outcomes directly, as well as excellent research in, in a room where you're studying fundamental processes that nobody has a clue how they can yet be applied to anything else. We're big enough, strong enough, and excellence to do to fill out the whole spectrum, ranging from the, you know, the deep disciplinary dive in a, what some people might say, esoteric topic, all the way through uh, translational work. But I think as we build, as we rebuild the economy, we need to have a focus now on translational work. We need to recognize our openness to the external communities. Because, um, because we're big, we can do things at scale. We have these many tens of thousands of uh, students, they need jobs, we need to connect to industry, we need to connect to all of these agencies, and we need to have an open innovative um, pipeline that goes all the way through and beyond. Thank you for that question too. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Colleen, for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank our audience. We've had over 200 participants. It's been a great showing. It's been a great conversation. Uh, we'll have a recording posted if you want to share it with others. And I'd encourage all of you to please stay involved uh, with the U of I as we continue to advance our federal agenda this year. And as Dr. Colleen said, please consider, if you haven't already, signing up with the Illinois Connection to help us move that agenda forward. Thank you so much, and I wish you all a great day. Thank you.